Hello to friends and colleagues from around the world. Thank you for joining our Earth Week event, where you will get a seat at the table to hear directly from state leaders on how we can win the future. My name is Julie Cerqueda, the Executive Director of the U.S. Climate Alliance, a bipartisan coalition of over two dozen governors that are working together to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. Through their actions, they are rebuilding a more equitable, resilient, and sustainable future. We have an exciting slate of speakers for you today. Alliance Co-Chair Governor Newsom of California is now going to kick things off, followed by National Climate Advisor Gina McCarthy. Hey everybody, it's Governor Gavin Newsom, and more importantly, a proud co-chair of the U.S. Climate Alliance. You know, we come together today on the eve of the White House's International Leaders Summit on Climate to mark U.S. Climate Action Week. And this is our chance to recognize, importantly, the organizations, businesses, cities, yes, and states that have filled the void left by the, well, let's just say it, previous administration's decision to turn its back, not just on the Paris Accords, but broadly, climate science as well. You know, it was then, not too long ago, that we were faced with that recklessness of denial and negligence, and that our bipartisan coalition of governors was formally born. We committed together to achieving the goals set forth in the Paris Agreement foundationally, and we committed, more importantly, to doing our part on bringing others along with us to advance this agenda. You know, since then, from Sacramento here in California to St. Paul, Honolulu to Hartford to, uh, well, other cities large and small all across our nation, we formed a coalition of governors committed to leading on climate. And with sound science as our compass, we paved the road on how to get there. And now our group of governors has grown to represent remarkable 55% of the U.S. population, 60% of the U.S. GDP. Each one of us, I think, is proof uh, that we all have agency, that we're not bystanders in this world, and we can help shape the future of our planet and of our economy. You know, just look at, at our state just as an example, like many of your states, where we set out some of the toughest emission standards in the country, and we quickly saw other states, the power of emulation, as well as companies across this country, uh, join in those efforts. You know, last year, in the absence of federal leadership, we also built on standards, including some of the most aggressive standards in the country, that require all new cars sold in the state of California to be emission-free by 2035. Since then, by the way, we've seen companies like Ford and Volkswagen, Honda, Toyota, and others follow that lead. There's even a new electric Hummer that's about to hit the market. But we haven't stopped there. I imagine nor have your states. While facing historic climate driven by wildfire season, California is setting out to be the first in the nation to conserve 30% of our state lands as well as coastal waters by 2030 to fight species loss and ecosystem destruction. And since then, the Biden-Harris administration have also joined California and more than 50 countries in that firm commitment. Our success broadly, your success, our success in California is proof that smart green policies and economic development, yes, do go hand in hand. But our work is just starting. As millions of Americans are getting vaccinated, businesses and schools are swinging back open their doors again, we have to build back and build back better. And that means building more resilient, sustainable, and equitable communities. That means investing in projects that advance racial equity and environmental justice and to increase opportunities for those that have shouldered the brunt of the health, climate, and economic crisis. And that means creating jobs for those that have been displaced and ensuring that transition, the real and just transition to clean energy is more than just platitudes, more than just a platform. Now is the time for bold federal leadership as well, supported by the hard work of states. In fact, earlier this morning, a group of governors from across the country, including very proudly myself, sent President Biden a letter urging him to lead by setting a federal standard to ensure that all new passenger cars as well as light duty trucks sold in the United States are zero emission no later than that 2035 date. We set that same goal, as I just mentioned, in California last year, and I know that we can all get this done. Together, we can unify, we can mobilize the country to meet this crisis head on. Time is short, but the decisions we make today will determine the sort of planet we leave to our kids. So today, hand in hand with the federal government, no longer closed fist, but an open hand, we renew our resolve. And there's no better teammate as our next speaker 
uh, will prove and demonstrate, who was kind enough uh, as well to join us today, and that's Gina McCarthy. Uh, she's the definition of a climate champion. Bold, thoughtful, forward-looking, and someone we're just proud and lucky to have serving as our national climate advisor. Gina, turning it over to you. Well, Governor, first of all, thank you for your terrific remarks and thank you for your compliments. It's, uh, it's really great to be working with you and with other governors who pure and simply get it, you know, and have been getting it for a long time. And I'll tell you, over the past four years prior to, to getting the opportunity now to work for President Biden, um, it was states that kept me sane. <laughs> It was states that told me that all the work that we had done under the Obama administration to make progress on pollution and on climate, uh, cha uh, uh, climate crisis, uh, you made me realize that we still had a future here in the United States and we had people fighting for that future every day. And so I just wanted to start by thanking each and every one of you for your commitment um, I can't tell you what the U.S. Climate Alliance meant to me and, and to colleagues and, and to the folks in the advocacy community and to our cities and our towns who, who were equally committed, not just to the science, but to understanding that we can solve this problem if we work together. And so I was enormously both grateful to you, but also incredibly excited about heading up this uh, whole of government approach that President Biden has, has uh, given to me um, to make sure that our cabinet across the board uses the power of the federal government and learns lessons that, ha that have been handed to us from the state government about what works, what might not, what else should we consider? How do we work together in partnership? because a whole of government approach doesn't just mean the federal government ought to get along, which is nice and actually challenging in and of itself because it's a big one, um, but, but also to, to figure out how we continue to support one another at the state and local level, because you are always so closely attuned to your own constituencies. And you've been really the ones that have been pushing forward with incredibly ambitious climate targets. Um, you have been taking the kind of action to safeguard your communities against some of the catastrophic climate events that we've been seeing. You've been pushing for the efficiency standards, not just uh, in, in our vehicles, uh, but also in our homes. You've been moving forward with 100% carbon free power. And so in many ways, I think the, that you have helped to provide the platform that gives me a sense of where we can head and how we can have learned from your lessons um, how, how to jumpstart our efforts on climate. So you really did show us what, po what was possible. Um, and so I, I will continually be grateful for that and continue to look for your partnership in this effort. I think you know that, that pri President Biden on day one rejoined the Paris Agreement that's terrific. We were really excited to be jumping ahead on that. This week is all about announcing a nat nationally determined commitment, which is called our NDC. And that's basically now that we've rejoined, how much do we think we can commit to by 2030 in terms of greenhouse gas reductions from 2005? And we know that in order to be credible, we have to be big, we have to be bold. And so two things happened. Um, we got together with our terrific cabinet. We've identified a way to move forward that I think will meet the test, the test that other countries are asking of us to show our strong commitment, but also the test that Secretary Kerry, who is the president's advisor, international advisor, um, he is going to be bringing together some of the most powerful leaders in the world tomorrow with President Biden over a two-day conference. And they'll want to see just how serious we are because that's going to give them the impetus they need to now also strengthen their commitments. Because this is all about the road, the road back to, to Glasgow, 
that we are heading on soon. And we need to make sure that we're all upping our ambition in accordance with the science. Because we now know that two degrees is not it. It's got to be one and a half and we've got to all do better than we've ever done before. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited for this whole of government approach. I'm excited to be able to be releasing a nationally determined contribution uh, that is actually going to meet this moment. And I am triply excited because of the American Jobs Plan that President Biden put on the table and is now really continuing to push hard so we can get it over the finish line, which is an investment in climate. It's an investment in equity. It's an investment in fairness. But more than anything else, it's an investment in our country and our people. It's going to go grow millions of good paying union jobs. It's going to advance our grid system, our transmission system, so that we can grab onto the renewable energy that's available to us. It's going to improve 2 million homes with new retrofits. Look at public housing, affordable housing. Make sure we're investing in transportation that's going to bring cleaner air to our environmental justice communities so that we can make sure that 40% of all the benefits of the American Jobs Plan actually goes to those communities left behind. It's going to put us on a trajectory to actually achieving a clean electricity se uh, sector in 2035 and net zero by 2050 because anything less is not going to meet the commitment that, that President Biden put in place and that we are targeting and we are going to get to. So it's an exciting Earth Week. Um, I can't think of a more exciting one than maybe the one I remember from 1970, uh, but I probably was a little too young to really realize how significant Earth Day actually can be. Now I know it because Earth Day is all about tackling the existential challenge of our time. It's about the federal government working with the state government and our local government here in the United States to show the world just how committed we are, the actions we can take, and the investments we plan to make so that we can hand our kids a, a future that we can all be proud of. So thank you for what you've done. Thanks for your continued partnership and onward and upward this, this uh, Earth Day. Thanks so much. Great, thank you, Governor Newsom and Advisor McCarthy for your remarks and your leadership. Our governors stand ready to work with you, um, Advisor McCarthy, as you say, to meet this moment and to invest in our people and our infrastructure. I think that was just incredibly eloquent to really capture the moment that we're in. So thank you for that. So now Alliance Co-Chair Governor Inslee of Washington is going to lead a discussion with his colleagues, Governor Janet Mills of Maine, Governor David Ige of Hawaii, and Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes of Wisconsin. But first, we have a short video from all of our governors, including those who couldn't be with us today. When the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement some four years ago, it was a group of governors that came together across their differences and formed the U.S. Climate Alliance. We need a healthy community and a healthy economy. It's good for America. It's good for Colorado. We vowed to meet the goals of the Paris Climate Agreement. Invest in, create, and support good paying jobs. Together, we will execute policies and programs that will set the environmental course for the future. Our environmental efforts will continue to be viewed through the lens of public health. We must work together to ensure we are leaving our kids with a better, more sustainable future. We can and will reduce harmful emissions and transform our economy at the same time. Working together towards our common goal of climate justice. Commitment to climate action is commitment to the economy. There's no question more needs to be done on environmental justice, transportation, resiliency, conservation, and energy efficiency. We need more leaders on both sides of the aisle and at every level of government to work together to meet these issues head on. Our success also depends on federal action. But we now have a president who is ready to roll up his sleeves alongside states to protect our nation and our world. The clean energy economy is a once in a generation opportunity. It will be hard, 
It will be the greatest test for government since we mobilized to fight World War II. It will be the greatest opportunity for advancement since post-World War II. Ensuring that the world we build as we emerge from this last year is a more equitable one. We are poised and ready to rebound. Embrace what we've learned together because we have a choice. We can do things the old ways that we know didn't work, but we can embrace and unleash the knowledge we already have. To rebuild our economy back better. Our children and our grandchildren are depending on us. Governor Inslee, would you like to start our panel? Well, thank you. It's just a joy to see leadership across the country in this alliance. Uh, I pre- appreciate everybody working on this together. I just want to make kind of a historical note about our discussion today. Uh, I think we're in an interesting moment historically. As you know, we started this alliance four years ago. The reason we did it is we knew there would be abject lack of leadership. In fact, a retrograde movement coming out of the White House then. So Governor Brown and Governor Cuomo and I started this thinking that we could keep the ball rolling and to keep hope alive and to show the rest of the world the United States is still involved in this in this uh, uh, very noble effort. And I think that uh, the last four years has demonstrated a couple things we can talk about today. First off, our alliance has demonstrated the success, the potential success, and the present success of any community that really wants to be involved in this effort, including states, obviously. We now have 25 states, and we have demonstrated big time the wisdom, not just environmentally, not just in health, but in economic success. I, I want to note that our 25 states have a GDP improvement four points better than the non-U.S. alliance states. We now have 2.1 million people working in our states, clearly in clean energy. We've added 133,000 just recently. We know that the greatest job creation sector is in clean energy. I think we've had great success demonstrating uh, the ability to move forward economically as well as environmentally. And I want to note that because I think it can serve us well, bolstering this new tremendous president's efforts that Gina McCarthy uh, talked about. But the second thing that I hope our discussion can illuminate is the ability to now go forward to be a full partner with this another administration that really does get it. Uh, We can't rest on our laurels. Yes, we have shown the light of experience, but now we have to be great partners because even with this tremendous success we're going to have with President Biden, there are many things that we can do more, better, faster, more uh, uh, locally in our states. We need to remain committed to this alliance. So I'm looking forward uh, this, uh, to this discussion. And we have some great leaders as part of this alliance for today's discussion. Uh, 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 Janet Mills of Maine, uh, David Iggy of, of Hawaii, Lieutenant Governor uh, Mandela Barnes. And I am looking forward to getting ideas from them. And one of the greatest things about this alliance is we learn from each other. We also challenge each other. We're kind of a competitive group, th- this species of governor. So I'm looking for learning uh, to learn some things. Let's start with Governor Mills. Governor Mills, um, I have been so impressed with what you have done on the job creation front, both of your ambition and your activities. And I just wonder if you want to share for us, you know, what your successes have been, what your learning experience has been, and what, you know, what's the next horizon for you uh, when it comes to making workplaces a, a priority? Sure. And hello from Maine to Wisconsin, to Washington, to Hawaii, and places unknown. It's great to see you all and to to address you. And thank you, Governor Inslee, for your historic leadership on climate issues. You've been a stalwart supporter of the Paris Agreements and um, of the other states like my own, 
who more recently joined the Climate Alliance. As soon as we could, we, we got there as soon as we could. Uh, as soon as I took office, that was one of the first things I did. And I'm so um, grateful to your leadership in this area. And thank you to Gina McCarthy for the incredible focus and leadership that you're providing. And so welcome back to the federal government. I'm so glad to see you in a leadership position now, again, on climate issues. And thank you to the US Climate Alliance for organizing this event. I'm proud to be among this great group of committed uh, people, governors and other leaders. Climate change, as you know, is creating difficult conversations for governors from how do we manage uh, rising sea levels in our coastal communities, communities that were built on the water's edge to how we support farmers and foresters facing increasing droughts and tick populations and other challenges, to what will we do to help uh, our fishermen uh, deal with the challenge of warming oceans. Um, and there are jobs involved in all of those challenges and we are discovering them and inventing them as we go. The good news is we already know that the transition to 100% clean energy is great for jobs and great for our economy especially in these kind of difficult times. The work to advance renewable energy, to weatherize homes, and even to manufacture efficient building supplies from wood, as you're doing in Washington State and I'm doing here in Maine, all of that has the power to produce thousands of jobs here in my state of Maine and in your states as well. We're already starting to see these jobs grow, even in these challenging pandemic times. For instance, we've got about 2,000 megawatts of power in the queue for solar projects. Um, those involve th hundreds, if not thousands of jobs, hundreds of new solar projects. So we're training up people in the community um, uh, technical institutes and the community colleges to become electricians, to become installers, to take those jobs. And they're good paying jobs too. So I'm very focused on getting people back to work post pandemic and as we got, get out of the pandemic, many people have lost their jobs in the paper mills that had long offered such stable and good paying careers. Others had scraped by in low wage jobs, service sector jobs, and they've lost those. And they're hoping for new opportunities and we're matching them with new green jobs, clean energy jobs. I'm very focused on accelerating job creation. Last December, I set a goal to double Maine's clean energy workforce by 2030, as our state released our four-year climate action plan, prop number one here. And <laughs> McCarthy was here in Maine when we kicked this off just about two, almost two years ago now. So this is our, our Bible, our commitment to clean energy with all of the detailed programs that we're putting in place right now. Maine has a requirement now codified of 80% clean energy on our grid by 2030. It's one of the most aggressive targets in the country, but to get there, we need to ramp up our skilled workforce and that's what we're doing. We need trained, committed trained workers, everything from electricians to HVAC technicians to engineers and contractors, researchers, developers. We need thousands of new workers with these skills and that's what we're focused on using the community colleges, using the university uh, and the high schools as well. These are well well paying jobs 25 percent above median wages nationally and they're needed in every part of our, our our country and especially in the rural areas in maine where economic development is sorely needed as you probably know maine is one of the oldest not the oldest state in the country so we're working every hard every day to keep young people here or bring them back entice them to come back when i look at the solar projects and some of the um, offshore wind development and the prospects for new jobs there, <clears throat> get younger people who want to bring their families here, raise their families here. So economically, green jobs are great for the economy. So we're doing everything from hoping to build CLT plants very soon, cross laminated timber using wood products, wood fiber insulation. We have a company, a young company taking over an old paper mill that closed a couple of years ago. And they're manufacturing first in the country, wood fiber insulation for homes and businesses. First floating wind turbine in the country we, we, we expect to have very soon. That's, that's our scale model, of course. And um, uh, investing in many innovations like that, that'll drive future opportunity for main workforce. I've heard Gina McCarthy say so often that we've got to make climate issues about improving people's lives, creating great jobs for Maine and in clean energy, uh, while we reduce emissions, 
improve public health, drive our economy is a tremendous win-win for Maine people. Well, Janet, I have to tell you, you know what I really like about what you're doing in Maine is that you are so uh, cosmopolitan, robust. You're not putting all your chips in one basket, one technology. Cosmopolitan, that's an interesting term for the state of Maine. Nobody in Maine would call us cosmopolitan, but thank no, you. No, no, you're very, you're very, ups, very upscale. And what I mean by that is you haven't just focused just on solar or just on offshore. You, you've, got the, you've gotten the whole you know, menu and to me, that's exciting. We share so much ecologically and economically between our states. We and, do, we do. And, and I think, you know, from cross laminated timber to wood, I mean, you've just you've done, you touched every base. You know, one of the things that I think we undervalue in this discussion sometimes is these jobs are above market. Yes. These are the value added jobs where you get the good. I, I, these aren't just any jobs. These are family wage jobs. And I think that's one of the things that, Sometimes we undervalue. I hope they don't may. <laughs> and just installing heat pumps, we made it a goal to install yeah. 100,000 heat pumps in the next few years. And yeah. we're getting there. And, and those are creating new jobs and reducing our dependence on oil for heat, you know, for heating sources, for residences and businesses both. So that's right. a big challenge in standing yeah, up. To tell me about your floating offshore wind platform, because obviously this is our goal on the West Coast as well. We have enormous resources. We well, do not have a program in the water yet. We have a lot of sort of research, but we don't have a program in the water. What's the status of your effort there? Well, again, this is the scale version. We have a great uh, advanced research and composites lab at the University of Maine, which with federal help has designed uh, this and has an ocean simulator actually in place in the universe at the university and has designed this. We've had a pilot project and we're doing a, a bigger pilot project pilot project off the coast starting to starting this summer laying uh getting ready to lay cable and and design uh design with a location picked out and then we're drafting a research project for floating offshore wind that is ready to go to boom very soon uh, and that also will be about within 20 miles off the coast of maine to research exactly how the effect, what effect this might have on fisheries and the environment, make sure we do it right. Because the Gulf of Maine, as you probably know, is about 36,000 square miles, miles. And so it's huge. Uh, and of course we don't own it as such, but it's got the biggest wind, wind capacity of almost any ocean body in, in the world. So we have that capacity, that advantage of being right there. And offshore wind is a beautiful, uh, project for the Gulf of Maine. Floating offshore wind technology has advantages. It's easier to get in and out of the water, easier to repair, easier to uh, move if we have to, that kind of thing. So we're, we've done about 10 years worth of study and research on this. We're ready to go put it in the water very soon. Well, I appreciate that. I'd like to have more discussion. By the way, you have a prop. I, I've got to show you mine. So here oh. it is, I want, I want to blow up. This is a picture I took yesterday in Arlington, Washington. It's one of the first uh, mini grids that we've established. So an independent mini grid with solar, uh, one megawatt of storage through lithium Ooh. ion batteries. I have a bigger and, one in Maine. I have a bigger one in Maine. Okay, well, I know that that would happen. But in any event, <laughs> uh, I just want to show you that we have solar energy in Washington too. And the, the largest manufacturer in the Western Hemisphere is actually Washington State. So right. we each are proud of, proud of our states. We have Jen, solar thank, panels on the governor's mansion too. Do you have well, it in your house? Uh, well, well, no, because we're so efficient. We just we just use excess heat. So anyway, <laughs> Janet, thanks for your leadership. You, I Governor. appreciate it. I'm glad we anchor the corners of our country. We now have Governor Ige, who um, uh, has been a real champion fighting the COVID pandemic. He's been so courageous uh, on the effort that, that he has taken to protect his people, but also from climate change. And under his leadership, it became the first state <clears throat> to make a commitment to 100% clean by 2045. And that took courage by him and his state to, at the time because it was the first. We have joined him now and I I think we've got a good plan as well. But I just wondered, uh, Governor Ige, if you could talk to us about what gave you the courage to do that in the first place and what, you know, what, what's been the successes to date on this effort? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Jay. And, uh, and Janet, I do have a uh, 
um, PV panels on the governor's mansion. So I uh, just really wanted to thank uh, you, Jay, for your leadership. As you know, you were uh, there at the very beginning of the U.S. Climate Alliance, and we jumped on board uh, as soon as you uh, put it together because we understood why it would be important. It's really great to see uh, all of you today uh, highlighting how states uh, have been leading for the past uh, four years and the opportunities we now have to win the future in partnership with the federal government. Now, I believe that Hawaii's commitment to 100% renewable energy was a watershed moment in the fight against the climate crisis. You know, Hawaii has reinvented our economy and the energy it relies upon uh, many times before. If you go back um, um, centuries uh, from sandalwood to whale oil and to sugar uh, and other power sources, but today we are the most dependent state on oil and coal power uh, to power our hospitality economy, to power our homes, our businesses, uh, to fuel jets to bring tourists here, uh, ships to bring our food and goods, uh, and tourists and, and residents getting around in their daily lives. You know, we send more than $4 billion out of state to import oil to Hawaii, um, which uh, is really uh, uh, sending money to create jobs elsewhere instead of uh, creating jobs here in the islands. Making the transition to renewable indigenous sources allows us to keep more of our money uh, right at home, uh, improving our economy, uh, our environment, and our energy security. Uh, reducing imports means increasing jobs and our gross domestic product. You know, as an electrical engineer by profession and a businessman, I understood that the future is 100% renewable. And even though we don't know exactly what that future will look like, what technology or how we will implement it, we do know that putting out that North Star, making that commitment uh, in 2015 was so important to drive how we transformed uh, Hawaii's economy. After signing uh, this measure into law in 2015, uh, I remember governors coming uh, to me at the NGA meetings uh, and asking, am I out of, uh, am I out of my mind? Um, how can you make such a commitment uh, at that time? Um, but you know, it didn't come um, out of the blue. We've been committed to clean uh, renewable energy uh, for more than a decade since the early 2000s. Um, in 2008, um, the effort was amplified and we started uh, the clean, Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative uh, in partnership with the US Department of Energy. Another important event at that time showed that this policy is good for the economy and jobs, uh, the Great Recession. Uh, when America was recovering from the Great Recession, it was renewable energy projects that led the way in Hawaii by helping to save thousands of uh, Hawaii construction jobs. From 2007 to 2012, solar construction rose from 2% to about 30% of the total construction dollars uh, in the state of Hawaii. Solar construction hired over more than 8,000 workers when the industry was struggling. In that same year, we sent $6 billion out of state to purchase imported fossil fuels. Uh, this past year, again, when he, he, Hawaii's economy faced the coronavirus and from which we are still recovering, Solar construction is again leading the way for us to build back better. During 2020, home PV systems, now with batteries, are being installed across the islands in homes of all level of incomes and backgrounds. Uh, installations in 2020 are almost 8% higher than in 2019, even during this COVID pandemic. And the solar industry continues to directly employ thousands of workers in diverse and well-paying jobs with a low barrier to entry, including construction, business, professional services, contractors, designers, uh, engineers, financers, installers, salespeople, and entire industry. I know I'm talking a lot about solar at the moment, but I think it's exciting about how high 
the number of homes with solar and battery systems in Hawaii is, and the ways in which it has transformed Hawaii's economy and made people's lives better. In many ways, as we look to the future, when all homes have some form of renewable energy, these jobs will be 21st century jobs. The versions of plumbers and electricians will be tied to clean renewable energy. So thank you so much for inviting me. I, I truly appreciate this opportunity to have this conversation. Well, thank you, David, for your leadership. I have to tell you, every time we talk, I just get visions of uh, of your beautiful state. And, and, and sometimes I dream of them during uh, meetings of these difficult year we've had. So thanks for inspiring us. You know, it sounds like uh, the COVID pandemic has not reduced your commitment. You've just been barreling right through with that job creation. Is that is that a fair? Ab absolutely, status? Jay. Yeah, and, and you know, for us, uh, it has been, you know, we've seen just like across the country, there's been a tremendous um, reduction in traffic, you know, our air and water uh, is significantly cleaner. And the one industry that continues to keep people employed is construction connected right. to solar projects, uh, right. as well as uh, other um, uh, construction industry jobs. And it has been uh, terrific, you know, many of our hotels took this opportunity because they knew they would be closed uh, to revamp and create more energy efficient facilities. Uh, we've looked at a number of uh, opportunities to accelerate uh, clean renewable energy projects uh, and bring them online sooner. And so we're excited about the opportunity and economic activity that is tied uh, with our commitment to clean energy. So, uh if I get a vacation anytime in the next four years, can I rent an electric car and use solar power to, to run that electric car to drive Ab in your hours? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, Jay, and uh, that's what makes me excited about the Biden administration's plan for this infrastructure project. You know, it's not only about what typically would be included in infrastructure, the construction jobs. It's really right. about rethinking how this transformation that has started in Hawaii can really be accelerated across the country where we can embrace clean renewable energy and create jobs at the same time. Well, I think I'm so pleased with what the president has proposed because it is comprehensive. Uh, I described Maine as cosmopolitan. I would describe the Biden plan as comprehensive because it's not just solar power, it's the electric cars to use the solar power. It's efficiency when you park your car in an in a energy efficient garage, you don't waste uh, heat. It's training programs for people. It's putting the investment uh, where it belongs in the, the, the environmentally degraded areas that have, have swallowed pollution for so long. It's, uh, it's land use policies in the, in the state lands or the federal lands that, that is so important. Uh, it, it just, you know, it's just soup to nuts. And I'm very, very excited about it because I think what, what they've done in the Biden administration is replicate, you know, probably all the good ideas that we've had in our states in the last four years under this alliance. I, I can't think of anything they, they haven't. Now there is, you know, one issue and some, you know, revenue generating possibility that could be in the future. But other than this, I think they've hit on all cylinders. Now they should get to have a vacation when they pass all these bills to go to Hawaii, stopping in Washington <laughs> for a week, of course, too. Uh, absolutely, Jay, that would be a terrific opportunity. And as you know, and I agree with you, you know, what the U.S. Climate Alliance uh, has done is allowed us to share uh, information and learn from each other. And, and Janet, I'm very interested in offshore wind because I know it's an important part of uh, Hawaii's future uh, and clearly uh, accelerating the the transition to uh, electric vehicles is something that we all are committed to. Uh, we know the sooner the infrastructure can change to recognize uh, zero emission vehicles, the better off our planet will be. Uh, and certainly working together is the best way to get there quickly. Definitely. Good well, thanks for, your, thanks for your leadership, Governor. We really appreciate it. Uh, we've now got a great Lieutenant Governor from Wisconsin who, and who we're really happy to have on this panel because he has made uh, 
both strides and commitment to environmental justice and all the work we're doing. And again, this is something I think I'm, I'm pleased with what President Biden has proposed. But Lieutenant Governor, talk to us about what you think you've been able to achieve and what do you think the next horizons are as far as from a justice uh, standpoint? We had a good day yesterday in America for justice. What can we do in the future in this realm? Yeah, well, absolutely. I want to first say thank you all for having me. Uh, I want to thank you, Governor Inslee, for your leadership. Uh, I want to thank the Climate Alliance as well. Especially just want to thank the panel of governors because I just know how much governors love when a lieutenant governor chimes in into a conversation. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I know this just delights you to no end. So yeah. I'm uh, really, really excited to be here. Uh, but I'll start out by saying, you know, Wisconsin has been uh, challenged on so many different fronts. Uh, issues of justice uh, being high ranking among them. Uh, we suffer from so many disparities in education and health outcomes uh, and, uh, and, and income, the list just goes on. And that's really the reason why I decided to uh, run for Lieutenant Governor. And people would always ask, well, how do we fix these issues? And one of the things that always came to mind was, well, we got to get this climate crisis under control because it touches so many of the other issue areas that we're dealing with. And for the eight years before we were in office, there was an administration that denied the science. There was an, an administration uh, that didn't pay particular uh, attention to any of the other issue areas of inequality uh, and inequity that we were dealing with. And I felt it personally, uh, you know, just growing up in a neighborhood, in a community, uh, like so many other lower income black and brown communities that uh, deal with the impacts of pollution, deal with the impacts of coal burning power plants not too far uh, from where children live that, uh, that ultimately lead to them having respiratory illnesses and other health issues. And when I became an organizer, this is one of the very first issues we took on. And recognizing, you know, my time in the state legislature, we, we, we tried to chip away at it, but finally uh, get into this office with a governor who truly understood and shared the same commitment uh, to addressing those issues. We led all of our work with equity in mind. You know, I took my oath of office and I said that we're gonna lead with equity and sustainability in mind. I'm proud that we were able to do that. And knowing that if we do better uh, from a sustainability standpoint, if we tackle the climate crisis like we should, we can create jobs in the process. And one thing, uh, you know, that's that, that's important. I was going to wait to talk talked about this part a little bit later. Not sure if we're going to get around to it, uh, but we can't be afraid of words like regulation. And I always point to the fact that it was, you know, the creation of the EPA uh, that led to the Clean Air Act. Clean Air Act meant that cars had new emission standards and vehicles then had to be built with catalytic converters. And my dad assembled catalytic converters for like 30 wow. years. So this was his entry point to the middle class. And I think that with that sort of thinking, we can do that uh, once again. I think we have to do that once again. This is the most um, this is the most logical path for us to go down, especially in a state like Wisconsin with so many vast natural resources. I'm glad nobody from Minnesota is on the line because we have more lakes than Minnesota. Uh, we are surrounded by three bodies of fresh water with uh, Lake Michigan to the east, Superior to the north, and uh, Mississippi River to the west. And that also presents opportunities for us to grow economically, but it also, uh, well, climate change, I should say, uh, inhibits economic activity because the Great Lakes are warming pretty rapidly. And this impacts uh, fisheries, our trout streams uh, that attract people from all across the world. If those streams warm, trout are gonna have to find a new habitat and it won't be here in Wisconsin and we're gonna have a serious problem on our hands. And when there are problems in rural Wisconsin, there are problems in suburban Wisconsin, there are certainly going to be um, increased impacts in urban areas in our state. And you know, I still live in Milwaukee and the issues that are present there, uh, you know, deal with in one way or another, uh, basically every day. And when we were thinking about how do we put together uh, the sort of plan to move us forward, uh, because I had a chance to chair the governor's task force on climate change, we wanted to make sure that voices were represented that weren't typically a uh, part of these sort of conversations. And these are the voices that absolutely need to be a part of the conversation. And 
I think that accessibility is one of those issues too, whether it's the people who are able to participate or whether it's uh, the people who are able to benefit from our vision that we're trying to propose. So we put together a set of 55 uh, climate solutions that span nine different sectors uh, here in Wisconsin. I'm incredibly proud of the work of the task force, but we had people in the room who didn't traditionally uh, have conversations with each other. Many times, these would be groups of people who were at odds <laughs> with each other, talked over or talked around. Uh, but the point is, uh, let's let's air those grievances out. Let's talk about where we're coming from on each side so that we can have truly, uh, you know, truly well thought out uh, solutions and proposals that came from those conversations. And in those talks, uh, we want to make sure environmental justice was at the forefront uh, because this impacts our lower income communities, it impacts black and brown communities tremendously, it also impacts our lower income and in, uh, rural and farming communities as well. And when the question comes up, well, well how do these proposals impact, uh, you know, our farming communities, our rural communities that won't this in, contribute to added costs? I was like, well, don't you think that flooding contributes to added costs for our farmers, you know, which is we're seeing these historic storm systems uh, that happen much more regularly than they should with no signs of letting up. That's going to have a world of costs on our farming communities. And if we implement, you know, more common sense solutions like carbon sequestration, uh, you know, using uh, working lands uh, to be able to have more solar, more wind farms, then that's actually not a cost to farmers. This is a potential for new revenue streams. And so we have to be also unapologetic in the way that we talk about uh, the issues as well. You know, we can't shy away from pieces of the conversation that may be a little bit difficult to talk about. Uh, one of the members on the task force who I uh, served within the legislature, a good friend of mine, you know, when we uh, were on the way to concluding the work, you know, I had a conversation with him, a follow-up conversation, and, you know, he thanked me for making sure that we talked about environmental justice because he's been at this for decades, and that just never crossed his mind. And it's no fault of his own. The guy, he does good, good work. He's a person that I look up to when it comes to this sort of stuff. And it's just a thing that never came across his desk, something he never had to talk about before. So as much as we can uh, talk about environmental justice, I think it opens the door for so many other issues of, of justice to be discussed. And you know, I, I believe that solving climate change will solve so many of our other problems that we have as well. Yeah. What, have, what has your governor been able to do through executive action? I know you've got a legislature who hasn't been totally cooperative on occasion, to say no. the least. Yeah, they uh, to, to say the least. Um, so <laughs> we're joining the Climate Alliance, but also creating the Office of Sustainability and uh, Clean Energy, and Great. then also creating that uh, task force on climate change where I got the chair. Yeah. And yeah. many of the recommendations from the task force ended up in the governor's budget. Mm -hmm. That's super. Well, we really appreciate your leadership and his as well. And uh, I think this is one of the great uh, rooms for growth in our movement is on this issue. And in our cap and invest bill, we're, we intend to maximize these opportunities. I know you'll do all you can with your legislature that you've got, but your leadership speaking on this really, really important. So I'm glad you're speaking up on a, on a national basis. So thank you for doing that. Thank you. And thanks for, uh, 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 you know, be willing to meet with governors too. You know, I know <laughs> lieutenant governors have their special little fraternity and sorority, but we, we, we appreciate it. Uh, hey, a quick question. Just, we only got a couple more minutes, but let me just throw this up open to anybody. What's the best way we can help the administration with their efforts? Any, any thoughts in this regard? Best way we can help? Um, well, I think we can lead by example. We've done a lot in the last few years um, lacking federal leadership, and now we have leadership in the federal government and the opportunity for a strong partnership there. So we can tell them what we need and what the people across the country need and what we're doing in our own laboratories of invention and uh, discovery uh, to say what, what's working and what's not working. What is working, for instance, is uh, electric charging, electric vehicle charging stations, more incentives for electric vehicles, 
um, heat pumps in states like ours, um, who, which need to get off their uh, dependency on, on oil and gas for heat. Uh, Governor EJ, EJ said that they have, they spend $4 billion a year on uh, oil for heat. We spend about almost $5 billion in a small state with only 1.3 million people. So heat pumps can uh, provide heat and air conditioning in the summer. Those kinds of things that we've been trying to do in our state on the state level, we can share with the federal government and ask them to be partners, investments um, and ideas exchanges. Well, I know we can do that. I hope we're all going to be active uh, taking our, our federal legislators by the hand to go look at our job creation locations as well. I've always thought that that could be useful to, you know, re-energize them, to actually take them. I think the governors ought to adopt a senator or a congressperson for a day and, and just take them to see where these jobs are located. I actually think that can help, you know, because then they can tell the story, right? Yeah. To support I, I yeah, I agree, Jay. I, th I think that that's um, a an excellent idea. And, you know, as Janet had said, I, I do think that um, the states are the laboratories and we actually have real projects that we've been able to implement. I mean, you know, it's so easy uh, and we all live in this social media um, era where it's easy to say no to things and why things don't work. Uh, and I do think that the role for governors and states are really to demonstrate how it can work and how it has worked in uh, each of our states. Uh, you know, just as uh, Lieutenant Governor Barnes had said, we are very much uh, interested in ensuring that um, everyone benefits uh, in this um, push to clean renewable energy. And you know, we have uh, community-based uh, solar projects and you know, we've pushed our utilities to ensure that uh, they can make um, um, no investment loans available uh, to uh, those who can't afford it to benefit from uh, the clean renewable energy projects uh, on a community basis and uh, many other examples of how, um, you know, we can make things work in a, a clean renewable transition uh, in a way that creates jobs and uh, creates economic activity. Well, listen, I appreciate this. I got a couple ideas here today. Uh, we always uh, want to inspire each other. Um, and I want to thank all the governors, uh, Gina, what she's doing, Governor Newsom, and everybody on this call, because we know we're not done yet, right? We've had some good work in our alliance for four years, but we both independently now in the next several years need to help our states, but help Joe Biden too. And I, and I intend to do that. You know, look, Joe Biden's working for my people. He's working for the IBW members that I saw yesterday who built this community solar project in Arlington. He's working for the solar panel manufacturers in Burlington. Mm -hmm. I went to this little plant that just hired another 100 people. He's working for the, for the lumber folks doing cross-laminated timber in Spokane. He's working for my people. So I know that our, we in this, our alliance are gonna help him every way that we can realize his vision. And I think that we can help him legislatively and economically as well, because there are things we are going to be able to do in our state that probably he will not be able to get through the federal legislature. But I believe I will be able to get done in my state. So we want to keep pushing those boundaries. So in the, in the next two or three year cycle, the federal government can keep up with our next step, too. And, I, and so I, I think that's important for our alliance not to be limited by our successes already. We want to keep dragging the federal government forward. And I know there's things we can do to help uh, in that regard. Well, again, thank everybody on this call. I hope you'll spread the gospel. I hope you'll help the Alliance. I hope you tell your governor to be half as good as Janet Mills or David Ige or <laughs> Tony or Newsom oh, yeah. or anybody else. And uh, let's keep challenging each other. In closing comments, I want to congratulate uh, David and Janet and Tony. Uh, they're doing a good job chasing Washington State, which has just named the best state in the United States twice in the last two years. And they're doing a great job continuing to push us forward to higher glory. So <laughs> and congratulations. <laughs> and clean energy is one part of that. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to uh, our moderator and be safe, be healthy. Thanks. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Dave. Aloha. Thanks, Jay. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much, everybody.
Great. Thank you for our esteemed panel. Um, and again, just signing off. Thanks for participating in the event and for supporting our our uh, governors and our state leaders. Have a good one. Thanks, Amelia. Take care. Thanks, Jay.